But the Lord put it in my heart to, to preach on the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Part one of this message is your kingdom come. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the next few moments that you anoint my tongue, that it would be as a pen of a ready writer to speak a word in season, to bring repentance, restoration, revival, and ignite a passion in your people for your kingdom, your power, your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You see, the Lord desires to give us His kingdom. But I, as I study the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, we found that this, I found that this term, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, are only found in the New Testament. Nowhere in the Old Testament can you find the words kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. The term kingdom of God is used 71 times in the New Testament. The term kingdom of heaven is exclusively used in the book of Matthew and is used 33 times in the book of Matthew. So it leads us to believe that something happened in the life of Jesus to activate or catalyze the kingdom of heaven on earth. Since it's only mentioned in the New Testament. So I've got a question for you tonight. What is the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of heaven is the headquarters from which the Father and King Jesus reign. Whereas the kingdom of God is the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven or evidence of the Father and King Jesus' dominion on the earth. Now what's interesting in scripture is that Jesus referred to the kingdom over a hundred times. But he only referred to the church twice. Only twice. But over a hundred times he mentioned the kingdom. And I looked that up. And I found that very interesting. One of the places where the church is mentioned is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. He said, I will pray to you and I will say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that word church in this passage of scripture is the word ecclesia. I want you to say with me, ecclesia. And the ecclesia literally means a called out legislative assembly or summoned army through which judgments are decreed and executed. Let me say that one more time. The ecclesia is a called out legislative assembly or summoned army through which judgments are decreed and executed. That's powerful. You see, the church is an assembled army of saints whose express purpose is to enforce King Jesus' dominion on earth through the decree and execution of righteous judgments. Say with me, righteous judgments. And these righteous judgments are rendered from heavenly courts with petitions accompanied by irrefutable legal evidence are granted. Let me say that one more time. Righteous judgments are rendered from the courts of heaven when petitions accompanied by irrefutable legal evidence are granted. Now a petition is also known as an appeal, a request, a plea, an entreaty. In other words, a prayer. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, taught us to pray to the Father this way. In this matter, therefore pray, let's say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's a powerful prayer. It's a powerful petition. It's an appeal, a request, a plea, and a treaty to the Father. It is a kingdom prayer that Jesus and the Father want to answer. And we're going to take a look at the first part of that prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, the word hallowed means holy and revered. But in looking at this passage of scripture, I realize that the first part of Jesus' prayer is not a petition, but instead it is a declaration of adoration. In other words, worship. You see, in order for our prayers to be answered and heard, we must follow kingdom protocol and begin with worship. Jesus is very specific on how we are to worship. In John chapter 4, verse 23, he says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So how do we worship in spirit? Psalm 63 records a psalm of David while he was in the wilderness of Judah. And it is an example of worshiping in spirit. In Psalm 63 verse 1 he says, Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. You see, to worship in spirit we've got to worship the Lord exclusively. God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. Not early I'll go to Starbucks. Early I'll go to Gold's Gym. Early I'll get on Facebook. No, early I will seek you. Amen. We've got to seek the Lord exclusively. We're also to seek the Lord wholeheartedly. It says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. He must have been speaking about Arizona. So I've looked for you in the wilderness. I've sought you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. We're to seek him exclusively, wholeheartedly, and exuberantly. Verse 4, he says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you, and I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands to praise your name. We're to seek him and worship him in spirit exclusively, wholeheartedly, exuberantly. In other words, we're to worship him with passion. God loves passionate worshipers. And that is what he is seeking. So if God is worshiping in spirit, how do we worship in truth? Psalm 51 verse 6 says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. You see, worshiping in truth is genuine worship out of a pure heart. In 1 Timothy, Paul addressed the church and he said, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, that's worshiping in spirit, but he goes on to say, without wrath and without doubting, that's worshiping in truth. You see, many people are secretly angry with God. They lift up their hands. But they're lifting their hands with wrath in their heart towards God. God, why did you steal my child? Why did I go bankrupt? Why couldn't I go to college? Why did you take my husband or my wife? And we're secretly angry and blaming God. But God looks us out. My Bible says that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of light. For them there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He's a good God. Amen? The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. So to anger the great mercy. Amen. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all of his works. Amen. 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 The devil, he steals, he kills, he destroys. And then he blames all on God. Amen. Big storm comes and wrecks the place. And they want to call it an act of God. You want to know an act of God? God's a good God. Amen. Amen. So don't be angry at God. God's a redeemer. He's a restorer. Amen? God wants to bless his people. But there's a real devil and there's a real hell. Did you know that in statistic, 50% of Christians in America don't even believe in the devil? Don't even believe in hell. Well, no wonder the devil's had us for breakfast. Amen? Amen? We don't even believe in the devil. Well, who do you think is, what, why all these things are happening? Why do you think people are sick? Why do you think they're diseased? Why? Because there's a real devil and there's a real hell. And one of the plans of Satan is to convince people that there is no hell or hell. Amen. It's a big lie. And we're to worship 
without wrath and without doubt. Do you know the people can worship and still doubt if there's a God? Even the disciples doubted. It says in here, right before he released the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. But when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. God is looking for people that will believe him. My Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And what? That he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I believe we've got some people in the house tonight that are diligent seekers of God. They have a zeal for God. They've got a passion for God. They want his presence. They want to know his power and his glory. Amen. And God answers passion. God answers hunger. And I tell you, when you get desperate enough for God, you cry out unto Him in the secret place, He will answer by fire. He will answer by fire. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus gives instruction. He says, pray to the Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You see, if we will seek the Lord in the secret place, He will have His reward. He will openly reward you. But if we're going to see the Father face to face, we've got to seek Him in the secret place. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells, say with me, dwells. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You see, there is a door open in heaven according to Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. And he gives an invitation to the church, Come up here and I will show you things that you know not of. There is an open invitation to come and climb Jacob's ladder and go into the secret place and abide with God in His glory. I've got a question for you tonight. What is required to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the Father? David asked the same question in Psalm 24, verse 3. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? And he gives an answer. You see, holiness is required to approach a holy God. He says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, whose soul is not lifted up to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. God requires of a holy people to approach a holy God with clean hands, a pure and undivided heart, and purged lips. Even Isaiah, when he came into the presence of God, great conviction came upon him. And he said, woe is me, for I'm undone, from a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King. You see, when you see him, you're going to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he will come and purge and purify you and make you a vessel of honor, fit for the master's use. All from the throne room of God, continually, perpetually, goes the voice, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Who shall I send? Who will go for us? But we can't hear his voice because we haven't seen him. We haven't seen him face to face. We haven't been convicted, purged, and purified of our sins. And that's why 80% of the church never hears his voice. It's really a shame. 80% of the church doesn't know what they're called to do. And this tells me one thing, that you haven't seen him in the secret place. Because he reveals his secrets to you in that place. In your book, they all were written. The days that you had fashioned for me, but yet there was none of them. God is a book with your name in heaven. And he has a high call, high and holy call that was written in heaven before time began, before Jesus, before Moses, before Abraham. Your call was written in heaven. And it is our job to ascend to the hill of the Lord and read from the books of heaven and through the spirit of prophecy declare what is the testimony of Jesus. Not only found in the Bible, but God's testimony about you written in the books of heaven. And as we prophesy to you, we're reading from the books of heaven and decreeing what saith the Lord that you can press toward the mark for the promise of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God, God is a high call in your life. Not a low call, not a medium call. The high call of God. It's our job to seek its face in the secret.
secret place to know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, and the inheritance of the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards you who believe. God's requiring faith in this hour. For you to believe him in this day, in this hour. You see, he is a blessing for us. Psalm 24 goes on to say, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. I believe God is raising up a Jacob generation of people that will spend time in the presence of God. And we've had a season of seven years where God has prepared a remnant to hear the voice of God, to be equipped by his power, to go in as the Joshua generation, to begin to take the promised land. But like Jacob, the Jacob generation will wrestle with God until they receive the blessing. It said they shall receive a blessing. Remember in Genesis chapter 32, that Jacob wrestled with God, and he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And God is looking for a people that will arrive and come boldly under the throne of grace. Come boldly under the throne of grace. To receive grace and mercy in your time of need. Receive the blessing. I'm not going to let go of the horns of the altar. I'm not going to let go of what God said until he blesses me. Hallelujah. You see, in order to wrestle with God, you've got to see him face to face. You ever see a wrestling match? You see that enemy. In this case, the Lord's not the enemy, but you're going to wrestle with him, amen? And you're going to see his face in a secret place. Even Jacob said, where he wrestled with God, he said, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, and that word literally means face of God. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Even Moses, it said that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. You see, if you want to be a friend of God, you've got to speak to him face to face. I promised my wife I would tell the story again. <laughs> you've all probably heard it. Maybe some of you got some new folks haven't heard the story. Very quickly. February 13th of 2013, I met the Lord face to face in a dream. First time. There'll be many more. And he looked into my eyes. I met him in the garden. And he looked into my eyes. His eyes were both sad and angry at the same time. He said one thing to me. He says, my people don't believe me. That's all he said. God is looking for a people of faith. He said he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you believe him, you will seek him. Because he has an answer for every one of your needs. Let's move on to the next verse. We're only going to get through two verses tonight. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to talk to you a few moments about kingdom authority. Now, as previously mentioned, the terms kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are only mentioned in the New Testament. Why? Why? Because the, because the kingdom of heaven on earth was introduced, demonstrated, and established through the life, ministry, and death of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection was the single greatest spiritual legal transaction in history. Yes. He not only legally secured redemption for all sins for all time, but he also legally established the kingdom of God on earth. During the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 18, this is, and Jesus came, this is after he's resurrected, or after he's resurrected from the dead, he came and he commissioned the disciples, and said that Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, say with the authority. Authority. has been given to me in heaven. He resurrected. He only had authority in heaven. But now he's got all authority in heaven and on earth. Amen. Jesus. And what do you do next? In the next breath. He says, Go therefore. 
therefore, in essence, go therefore in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you, known as the Great Commission. Now, in another account of the Great Commission, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise, say with me, promise, of my Father upon you. But tarry, or wait, in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power, say with me, power, from on high. You see, while Jesus conferred his authority to his disciples to establish his kingdom on the earth, they also needed to be equipped or endued with power. I've got a question for you tonight, I'm full of questions. What is the difference between authority and power? Authority gives one the right to rule and reign. Whereas power gives one the might to rule and reign. Say that one more time. Authority gives you the right, power gives you the might. Let me give you an example. I know Mike's a, a police officer of sorts. Hallelujah. But you know when he was authorized to do what he does, they gave him a badge of authority. Amen? Amen. But that badge didn't do him any good until they gave him a gun. <laughs> There's the power. The badge is the authority. The gun's the power. Amen? So in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, But you shall receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus gave us the authority, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power is the kingdom of God on earth. That's why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? I want to talk to you a moment about kingdom residence. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen? The kingdom of God is within you. So, the kingdom of God is established through believers by the Holy Spirit who resides within believers. So, I have another question for you tonight. If the kingdom of God is within us through the person of the Holy Spirit, how did the Spirit gain entrance? Well, in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Most assuredly, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you must be born again. Matthew 18, verse 3. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So we are to come as children. You know, the disciples uh, were hanging out with Jesus. There's a bunch of kids running around. And they're trying to get, uh, get these kids away from us. And Jesus got upset. He said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So we're to be born again. Become his children. And he also said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, the scribes and Pharisees were a bunch of hypocrites, amen? Yeah. So we can't be hypocritical. We've got to live righteously. Matthew 7, 21. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus said, I don't do what I want to do. I do what I see the Father doing. Where's the Father? The Father's in heaven. Well, how does he see what the Father's doing unless Jesus is in heaven? Did Jesus ascend to the hill of the Lord then? 
regularly come to the secret place. How did he see what the Father's doing unless he was in heaven with him? And see, that's what God is requiring us of us. To not only hear his voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit, but to ascend to the secret place and see and hear what the Father's saying and read from your book in heaven. Many of you have never seen your book. It's something in the spirit. Amen. But God is wanting to speak to you from your book in heaven. Amen. I'm going to talk to you a moment about the kingdom preaching or the gospel of the kingdom. You see, the gospel of the kingdom of God is a very specific message that must be preached to all nations before Jesus returns. Matthew 24, 14. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. What is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven draws near. Meaning that for you to receive the kingdom, you've got to repent. Jesus, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Matthew 4, 17. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'll tell you what. If that message is good enough for John the Baptist, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. But most preachers in America are not preaching repentance. They're not preaching the remission of sins. Part of the Great Commission in Luke 24, Jesus said to them, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. That's part of the Great Commission. But we're not preaching that. This preacher is. preaching in America. We're preaching what people want to hear instead of what they need to hear. We're tickling ears instead of touching hearts. But I tell you what, God is going to deliver the pulpits of America from mammon because you, see, you can't serve God in mammon. He's going to deliver the pulpits of America from mammon and he's going to purge and purify by fire and touch the hearts of his preachers. Why? Because it begins in the pulpit. If what you're Amen. Whatever goes to the pulpit goes to the pews. And God is looking for people that are purged by the fire. Preachers that will preach repentance to America. Yeah, a, a Hollywood wants to laugh at us, right? I see some things on TV recently that makes me, I'm not going to say. Amen. But mocking. Mocking preachers, mocking Pentecostalism, mocking what God's doing. But how many of you know the Bible says that God is not mocked? Where a man sows, that shall we also reap. And God will vindicate and justify himself in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. Because I believe that he's raising up a company of prophets in the spirit of Elisha with a double portion of his spirit to preach repentance to America. Amen. Without repentance, no revival. Period. And I'm not talking about browbeating. I'm talking about preachers that have spent time in the secret place, that have come with a fire of God in their bellies, coming out of their mouth, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord descending upon the congregation. And in the fear of God, repentance goes forth. Amen. True repentance. You know, this preacher isn't going to beg and plead. If the Spirit's not drawing you, I'm not going to. It's my job to preach repentance and let the Spirit of God bring the conviction. Amen. Amen. You know, Charles Finney was the most successful soul winner that ever was. 80% of his converts stayed true to the gospel. Whereas in most uh, evangelists today, and this is no reflection on anyone, do you know that less than 5% the people that walk their aisle, they come just as they are and they go back just as they were. Why? Because we're not preaching the full gospel. It's not, oh, pray this for the little prayer and everything is all right. It doesn't work that way. When Charles Finney went people to Christ, he thoroughly challenged them. Are you ready to die to self? Are you ready to pick up your cross and follow him? Are you ready to die to your flesh?
church and give up everything for the gospel. Yeah. And if you're not, then don't come up here. In fact, come back tonight and I'll tell you more about it. See, he thoroughly challenged him. And there is a price to pay to follow Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, when they made that commitment, they stayed true to Christ. Those people, they did a, a, a 80 percent. See, that's the kind of results God wants in this hour. We're not playing games anymore, church. You'd be surprised how many people that go to church are not even saved. They think they are because they've heard this soft gospel and they, they're, they're, they're not even saved and they don't even know it. And, and what's happened is, is when they receive the inaccurate word, the false word, they become inoculated from the true gospel. Oh, oh, I've already done that. I've already raised my hand. I already prayed that prayer. I'm born again. And they're not. And they never repented. Never repented of their sins. That wasn't in the notes. That must have been the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lost my place. Let's talk a little bit about evidence of the kingdom. Got another question. What signs accompany the preaching of the gospel? Providing evidence that the kingdom of God has come. You know, I thought it'd be a little bit funny, but I decided not to be. I, um, I was going to put, you know, how many of you seen that commercial for Wendy's like 20 years ago? And the lady goes, where's the beef? Yeah. Where's the beef? Yeah. I'm challenging the church. Where's the beef, church? <laughs> But I didn't put that up there. I was going to put it up on the slide. Anyway. Where's the beef, church? Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And these signs will follow those who believe. Number one, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. You know, we don't preach that. We don't preach it. We just preach, oh, come to Jesus, you'll be saved. Come to Jesus and get more money. Yes. Come to Jesus and be happy. How many of you heard that one? Yes. The happy gospel. My Bible don't say that. You know, we bought into the American dream instead of taking on God's dream. They're very similar with one distinct difference. The American dream is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is God's dream. Life, he said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Yes. Liberty, who the sun sets free, is free indeed. Amen. But he didn't ask us to pursue happiness. He said, pursue holiness. Yes. Without which, no one will see the Lord. Yes. You see, if we would preach holiness, we'd have more people ascending in all the Lord and seeing the face of God. They would be changed. They would be transformed from glory to glory. And he's going to cause the rebellious church to be jealous of the power and the glory that God's revealing through his remnant that's here tonight. Yeah. Hallelujah. He said, in my name, they will cast out demons. That's evidence of the kingdom. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen? Jesus spent one-third of his ministry casting out devils. But nobody wants to believe that. I know these folks here do. <laughs> and I hope that you've been teaching about casting devils out, because that's what we need. We've got pastors counseling out hours and hours of counseling when all they need is a devil cast out of them. Amen? Yeah. I got news for you. You can't counsel out a demon. You gotta cast out a demon. It says they will speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. Some people say, you shouldn't do that on TV. This is going on YouTube. 
Okay, so let's go on TV. Yeah. I speak in tongues out there. You can have all you want. But don't come asking me why there's no power in your church. Because you're gonna take people to power, and you're gonna pray in the Holy Ghost to get power. If you want to know the answer, you gotta pray in the Holy Ghost. And now these quiet little tongues. Yeah. Okay, because we're, anyway. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, they will in no means hurt them. Okay, now, I know the Appalachian Mountains, they like to pick up serpents. In fact, my wife Kay talks about it. In fact, there's a, a book back there, uh, The Stargate of the Serpent, that talks about the serpents, and they show, you know, these snake handlers. How many of you know that's tempting God? But! Like Paul, you put, actually put your hand in the fire and the viper comes out and bites you, that God will protect you. Or if you accidentally drink some bad stuff, God will heal you. Amen? That's what that means. Amen. It says, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You see, the gospel of the kingdom is followed by signs and wonders. It says, Jesus went to all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every, say with me, every, every sickness and every disease among the people. There's coming a day, church, when all shall be healed. All will be healed. Jesus paid for all, when they all get healed. And we just got to believe God for that, amen? I want to talk about kingdom seeking. You see, the kingdom of God is not going to be manifested uh, through us just because we're saved and just because we're filled with the Holy Ghost. I know a lot of lukewarm Christians that still speak in tongues. Why? Because they become complacent. They become complacent. You see, we've got to be intentional about seeking the kingdom. We've got to make seeking the kingdom our first priority. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, say with me, things, will be added unto you. You see, people are wondering about what I'm going to eat, what am I going to drink, what am I going to wear, what am I going to do? And the Bible says that after all these things, the Gentiles seek. But my Bible says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy Amen. in the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 You see, we're so consumed with things, that's why there's so many that don't enter the kingdom. Jesus said, surely I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you're consumed with things. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to simplify my life. You know, so I don't be worried about this. I don't be worried about that. We need to be solely focused on the kingdom. I'm preaching to myself tonight, and I'm enjoying it. I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying it. Every Saturday night, I get a pep talk. I'm encouraging myself in the Lord. I need this just as much as you. Amen? Amen. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. All these things we be born of. We seek first the kingdom. All the rest will take care of itself. Right. Amen. Now this is the best part of the message. Kingdom suffering. Everybody loves to suffer. <laughs> you see, seeking the kingdom of God comes with a price. Acts 4, 14, 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. You don't hear that preaching in America. You don't hear that. 2 Timothy 1, 5, they suffer. My Bible says that we will, if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified together with him. But there is a sacrifice, a kingdom sacrifice, the price for obtaining the kingdom sacrifice, kingdom of God.
God is sacrifice. In Matthew 19, verse 12. It says there are eunuchs born from the mother's womb. Eunuchs made by men. But there are eunuchs that have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He was able to accept it, let him accept it. What I believe that's saying is that there are those that have sacrificed the pleasures of marriage to be married to the Lord. Amen? Luke chapter 18, verse 29. Assuredly I say to you that there is no one that has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in the present time and in the age to come eternal life. You see, if you have to lay down some things for the kingdom of God, God will bless you back. Amen. He'll multiply. Press down, shaking together, running over. God will bless you. He'll minister to and through you. And once you've sacrificed, once you've put on the altar, God will bless you again and bring it back. I believe that there are those that have forfeited their natural inheritance for a spiritual inheritance. For those that lay their lives down for the kingdom will receive a kingdom inheritance. Matthew 5 verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You will incur wrath. You will incur ridicule. You will incur betrayal for the sake of the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. James chapter 2 says, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Which he promised to those who love him. So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? To be poor in spirit means to be empty and inadequate spiritually in and of ourselves without the Lord. In other words, to be poor in spirit is to be humble in spirit. And finally, I want to talk to you tonight as we close. I want to talk to you about kingdom greatness. Well, God has called us into his kingdom. We have to walk worthy of the kingdom in order to have the greatest impact. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. Hebrews 12, 28. Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. My Bible says that. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If we will humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt us in this season. He will give us grace, for he has given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We can't trust in the kingdoms of men. We've got to trust in the kingdom of God. We've got to sow into the kingdom of God. We've got to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus said, whoever breaks the least of these commandments, and teaches men will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches his commandments shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It just doesn't say teaching, it says doing. Amen? Yeah. Not just teaching, but doing his commandments. And finally, the last scripture tonight is, I'm going to ask Eric and his team to come. Kingdom greatness is defined by Matthew chapter 18 and verse 4. It's really funny. I used to, for years, probably 15 years, I used to carry a book along with me, written by Andrew Murray. It was just called Humility. In this scripture, he said, Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. We've got to walk humbly before our God. We've got to let the spirit of the fear of the Lord predominate us. And if we will humble ourselves under his mighty hand, he will exalt us in this time and this season. If everyone will stand. Hallelujah. We're just going to spend some time before the Lord in his presence tonight. He's going to lead us in prayer tonight. Lord, 
Lord, we know it is your good pleasure to give us the kingdom of God. So therefore tonight, God, we humble ourselves as children.